Okay. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name's Sue Kilday. I'm uh, a midwife, mad passionate midwife and a researcher and the co-director of the Molly Watagooga Research Centre at Charles Darwin University. And um, I'm talking to you today from uh, Central Arundel Lands in Central Australia um, and part of Alice Springs. And um, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge um, that I am on the lands of the Central Arundel people, that um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, elders past, present and emerging. And I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the extraordinary strength and resilience of all of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women who have um, birthed beside women for many, many years, over um, 60,000 years. And uh, um, as many of you would know, the Centre for Research Excellence that we've um, got here at the Molly Centre is um, I work side by side with Professor Yvette Rowe, uh, the Professor of Indigenous Health. And one of the key things that we try and do in this centre is um, uh, support the Indigenous knowledges and um, privilege Indigenous knowledges and enable uh, change systems um, so that we can actually uh, um, get uh, services to actually meet the needs of mothers and babies, not necessarily of professionals, which um, you know many of our services do. So um, I'm delighted today to introduce Anne Bosfield. And um, some of you may know her. Um, she's a mad, passionate midwife. Um, not mad, mad, but madly passionate. <laughs> um, and she's currently working in the office of the Chief Nursing and Midwifery Officer in office in um, Queensland. Um, her substantive position is as clinical midwife consultant in um the sort of southwest area of Queensland, which is um, a large geographical area that has maternity services or midwifery services in um, Roma, in Charleville and St George. And she's going to talk to us more about that today and how she worked with those services to actually um, really change the way they operate and embed more continuity of midwifery care. Um, so she'll be able to tell us more about that today and we'll have time for questions. Um, she's um, uh, also been a, a member of uh, a variety of different statewide groups. Um, Queensland has done quite a lot of work trying to improve the services in um, rural areas and remote areas. The Rural Maternity Task Force um, Anne was a member of and there's fairly um, good reports on Queensland website talking about how they're trying to change services in um, rural and remote Queensland. So um, without any further ado, I might uh, hand over to Anne. I'll just to ask everybody to um, put their um, uh, microphones on mute. Uh, if you've got questions and you put them in the chat, I'll try and keep up with them towards the end of the session and we'll try and get some interactive questions and answers going. Um, and... Uh, just one other thing, I suppose, I should probably say, one of the major reasons we asked Anne to talk today is that um, we invited her to come up to Nullumboy Hospital in um, northeast Arnhem Land, where she actually told us a little bit about her story. Um, we're involved in a redesign of services um, in Arnhem Land, and Anne was uh, great coming up, telling us about how she'd done things down there. So we then asked her if she'd um, kindly... Uh, tell us a story for a CRE seminar. So over to you, Anne. Thank you very much, Sue. Um, it's nice to see some, some familiar faces and thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm absolutely thrilled to be able to present this to the Molly Water Guga Centre uh, because the work that everyone does there is just so, so important. And I have to um, uh, ditto everything that Sue said about the amazing resilience of um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait, Torres Strait Islander women over the year and birthing on country and all those amazing things. I love midwifery continuity of care models and what it does for women and how important that is to families and to children. And we see the benefits of these models amplified for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities and women. And I know that I'm preaching with the converted when I say that 
you know, imagine if there was another profession that could make the dints and things like preterm birth or stillbirth that, that midwives can do in midwifery continuity of care models. Um, it would be almost unethical not to provide it. So how important are midwives? And um, thank you to all the midwives on this group who provide such um, important work to our women and communities. Um, just a little bit about myself. I'm a country girl. I was born in Mitchell, which is um, in southwest Queensland. Um, and so I grew up there and I grew up on an isolated sheep station between Mitchell and Bollin. And you'll be able to see that on the maps that I show in a few minutes. And my mum was a city girl and she was a teacher. So she got transferred to Mitchell to be a teacher where she met and married my father and then found herself living on an isolated sheep station and away from her family, her friends and all of her social circles. So my mother had four children and I was the second. And while she's a real pragmatist and she doesn't complain, she brought her babies home to an isolated remote setting with absolutely no support at all. And she tells the story that she breastfed my older sister for about one to two hours for six weeks because she cried all the time. And then she went, did the big trip into town um, to, for her six week checkup and found that her baby was still hadn't regained birth, her birth weight. So I don't think that's acceptable now. And, um, and my mission is for rural and remote women to get really, really good care where they live and um, to get that support across the pregnancy continuum because it's just so important for the, for, it's got lifelong benefits to um, women and their babies. And I actually don't think that's a big ask at all. So um, I became a midwife in 1986 in Toowoomba where I worked for four years and then I went to the south, back to the Southwest, back to my home, home country. And I didn't stay there long because we didn't have a, a really established retrieval services then. And I almost had a couple of prem babies on a few little tiny planes because we did our own retrievals then. And I thought I wanted to study neonatal ICU just so that I had more skills in being able to manage that situation if ever arose. So I went to the Royal Women's in Melbourne to study neonatal ICU. But then like my mother, I met a man, I got married. And so I stayed in Melbourne for a while. And um, I found myself working in a freestanding birth centre with an amazing obstetrician who was a friend of Michelle Odont. And so that birth centre, the Hawthorne Birth Centre, did a lot of work um, starting, you know, with introducing water birth to Australia, et cetera. And one of my jobs in the early 1990s was to travel around Australia teaching water birth when it was really quite a new thing. Obviously, it's not a new thing now. And one of the places I did go was Alice Springs for the 1996 Australian College of Midwives Conference to, to talk about that. So, um, but it was at the Hawthorne Birth Centre that I first got my taste of what midwifery continuity of carer could do for women and the superior care that you could provide. You know, when you know a woman and you know her fears and her dreams and her desires, you know, her relationships, you know, a relationship with her mother, for example, which is a really important relationship to consider, uh, the beliefs she's grown up with around birth and when knowing all that information, you can really work in partnership with women to provide a really unique, you know, tailored package of care. So from there, I moved back to Queensland, to Toowoomba, the husband and a son. And um, I got into clinical educator roles, working from um, lecturer at a university in midwifery. And then we developed an MGP in Toowoomba, which was a bit of a long, hard process to do because there was lots of resistance. Um, but Ultimately, I became a case load midwife again, like I had when I was in private practice in Melbourne, and um, then did a few projects, a birth centre project, and then I set up an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, maternity service on the Darling Downs before I moved back to the southwest. So that's just a bit of context where I came from. So we've been providing continuity of midwifery care for women in southwest Queensland now for 11 years. And just to give you some context, Sue's already spoken about the, um, the size of the Southwest Hospital Health Service. Um, it starts just east of Roma and extends out to the Northern Territory, South Australia and New South Wales borders. It's got three, it's about 320,000 square kilometres and it's sparsely populated with about 27 
7,000 people in all that area, which is, you know, approximately 20% 20, 20 bigger than the state of Victoria. And I think when I was up in Nulamboy, I was saying that we'd done some calculations to about a quarter of the size of the Northern Territory. Uh, but of course, people who live in the Northern Territory know all about, um, you know, long, long, vast spaces, just like we do in Queensland and WA, etc. Um, so this is the this is the hospital health service, and I'll just see if I can get my little laser pointer and see if that works. So. Um, we have three level three maternity services, as Sue was saying. We have them in Roma, St George and Charleville. And um, Roma's got a population of about 7,000 people and we have about 150 to 160 births a year. Then down south, 200 kilometres to the south is St George, which has got a population of about 3,000 people and we have 40 to 50 births a year. And Charleville is similar to St George, though it has about 3,500 people and around about 50 to 60 births a year. Now, these three birthing hubs, um, they've all got their unique quirks and challenges as um, any, any service does. And whilst we've done a lot to standardise practices across those three birthing services, um, they are quite different. They can change quite quickly, um, when, particularly if you've got a small cohort of midwives and one of them leaves and you lose, you know, a third or a quarter of your workforce. It's a big blow and it causes a whole lot of disruption. So... Um, it's because it's such a big geographical area, you know, we have a lot of different industries in it from one side to the other. We've got uh, up there in the top left hand corner, that's the Roma cattle yard, sale yards. We've got the biggest um, cattle sale yards in the Southern hemisphere. And we've got also got a, a thriving gas and oil industry. And we've also got lots of wide variations in cropping. And St George, for example, is right there amongst that big area of cotton growers that we have in, um, in South Queensland. So the next slide is the hospitals that we have. And um, you can see down here, that's a Charleville hospital. It's one of our oldest ones. We've got St George up here with its iconic jacaranda trees going up the avenue. And then up here in the top left-hand corner is the Roma hospital. And that's a, that's a new hospital um, that um, we've been in now probably around about two years. Um, so there's got we've I've just because I've shown it before and people wanted to see it again I've had I've had questions that or people requesting to see it. Um, this is the Roma Hospital, but then we, I'm just showing you our courtyards and the birthing pool etc. at the Roma Hospital and those birth suites. And this was it's actually quite nice because the court each birth suite each of the two birth suites opens out onto a courtyard and this is part of a co-design process with the community and particularly with the Aboriginal community who really wanted to be able to walk on the ground when they're in labour and this photo was taken two years ago so those um, native plants etc there are now a little bit more bushy than what they were then so um, it's becoming more private as the as the um, as that native vegetation grows so um, we've also got a co-design thing happening with Charleville soon for their birthing suite, so we're excited about that and maybe we can be able to get similar sorts of things incorporated there. So this is the Southwest Maternity Activity for 2021-22. Now, I didn't bother going and you know, grabbing all the 22-23 data, but it's much the same. Um, I think there's just been a difference of 19 births in between those two financial years, 2021-22 and 22-23. So I'm just going to go off um, the 2021-22 data because there's, um, you know, there's very little variation. So here we had, at this in, during this financial year, we had... 262 births across the whole of the southwest, but we provide additional care for antenatal and postnatal care for women um, that actually birthed away. And that the, those women are also calculated within our caseload ratios, because as you'd probably imagine, a high-risk woman can be more work than um, than say a low risk and who's going away to birth and say a low-risk woman who's giving birth locally. But there are three main reasons why they birth away. And number one is the women who are high, who have risk factors that are outside of the capability of a level three maternity service. And they'll usually either go to Toowoomba or Brisbane, depending on the, the, the actual um, issue that's been identified. We also have a, a cohort of women who will birth in a private hospital. 
um, towards the east towards the border, and that is uh, towards the coast, sorry, and that is often they, they can be low risk women, but they can be some high risk women as well who are seeking private obstetric care, uh, probably receiving um, continuity, often a continuity of obstetric care from when they've had risks with their with you know previous children. Then the third lot are those women that relocate for birth because they're relocating back to where their family lives and so they can get that extra family support during those during following birth, you know, particularly in that postnatal period. So in Roma, we have um, eight FTE of uh, midwives working there. Um, although that they were all case though, there's been a bit of tinkering around the edges in the last couple of years. Um, but there are 167 women birthed locally and 40 women would birth away. In St George, we had three FTE, um, uh, 42 women birthing locally and 24 women birthing away. So there's 200 kilometres between Roma and St George. Um, we've often had to sustain two FT in St George with a little bit of outside help because um, staffing is quite difficult, as it is in Roma at the moment as well too. And then finally, we have four FT in child in the far southwest, west, where 53 birthed locally and 43 women birthed away. We also have a flying obstetric service, which is... Um, uh, managed by the MARTA, so they are based in Roma and they'll provide emergency maternity care across anywhere in the southwest at any time, but they also run their outpatient gynae clinics, etc., women's health clinics in southwest, um, central west, up Longreach, Bar Cald, and a few places like that, and also areas of the Darling Down. So they're a great support to us as well. And uh, we have the usual things in rural remote problems, such as deficits in some levels of allied health and even access to ultrasound from time to time. So we started our model in um, 2012 and we had a number of elements going for us at the time. Uh, there was convincing evidence starting to really come out in the literature about the about continuity of midwifery care and um, how you could improve outcomes for women. We had Gundawindi, which was just a few hours up the road from us, and they had a successful MGP at the time. They'd been running for a few years. And this last, this year, they've celebrated their 15th um, birthday of their Gundawindi MGP, and it's still going strong. But the planets were somewhat aligned because we had, and I'm not saying it was a smooth transition to MGP because um, I don't think any of those things are necessarily always smooth, but we had a really enthusiastic director of nursing and she was a passionate midwife and we had an executive director of nursing and midwifery who knew that things had to change because Operationally, we could no longer recruit the registered nurse midwife who would be able to be rostered one per shift, for example, to maintain a maternity service. We just couldn't recruit those anymore. And in fact, Charlotte and St George, for example, we wouldn't be able to have them as a maternity service at all now if we hadn't actually changed that model of care. We also had a really enthusiastic Aboriginal health worker and um, she advocated day and night for her mob to, to get um, continuity of care models, midwifery continuity of care models going. And we also had the executive director of medical services behind us, which, I mean, that's kind of like a straight flush for us, really. <laughs> we had it all going. And... And I think one of the really pivotal things, and I've, 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 I'm saying my, I love the similar information, as I said, when I was up in Nullumboy, but our director of nursing, she navigated a process to get the amazing Sue Krusky to come to Roma to facilitate a workshop with lots of key stakeholders. We had medical officers, dons from all the multi-purpose health services outside the hub sites. We had midwives, nurses, some consumers and um, health workers coming and that was really really important to us because this was as I said 12 years ago possibly even 13 because it took us a year or so to really get cracking um, but our midwifery teams for that first time had that real insight into the power of evidence and um, we saw Krusky she masterfully and respectfully challenged medical officers and some nurses and midwives who had their had a few things to say and um, she was able to just clarify the evidence with all of us and it was a real um, 
it was a really powerful thing for our midwives to see. They hadn't quite realised the power of evidence before and the fact that the, the evidence sat with midwifery continuity of care models. So even though our director of nursing and I, we would sort of talk about it all the time, it wasn't until that workshop that it became a really real thing to them. And so that was our launching pad. And I think about um, speaking to Yvette Rowe when I was up in Nuremberg in February, March, and she was saying what a great opportunity there is to make meaningful change in the Northern Territory at the moment. And, and that was us in 2012, you know, but if we had to undergo the same process today, it could very be a very well be a different story. So Yvette's thoughts really resonated with me um, at, that you need to grab the opportunity, you know, when it arises. So the next part of our journey um, was that in 2012, we did a staged approach and um, we started in Roma and we commenced the four MGP midwives, but we also main, maintained a course core midwifery service. And some of those midwives who knew were going to be attrition, uh, going to be leaving us anyway in that core service because they were moving elsewhere and their husbands had positions elsewhere. Um, and we always knew it wasn't sustainable because of our birthing numbers, uh, but we wanted to get started and we wanted to give the women in our in our health service a taste of what midwifery continuity care could do for them um, so in that 11 years that since we started we've made some really considerable inroads um, you know you don't actually have to be a registered nurse to work in a maternity service in a rural remote area and um, even though that still rears its head even today, and you'll see that amongst some nursing literature about the need for dual degree um, nurses and midwives in rural or remote services. Um, but there's now, I think, a widespread recognition that bachelor midwifery midwives are trained very well and that they're here to stay and they're going to be the bulk of our workforce. So I think that message has gotten through. But my goodness, there were some battles in the meantime. And, you know, so the, there's that saying, isn't there, that culture eats strategy for breakfast. <laughs> and, and, and the cultural change is really difficult and sometimes painful. Um, so we had that real cultural change when I first started employing bachelor midwifery midwives in our, um, in our maternity service. And it, that, that pushback came from both midwives and from, sorry, it came both from nurses and nurse midwives. Uh, not from obviously the bachelor with midwives mid themselves. Um, even from, you know, I would have, it came from all sorts of different corners, you know, even some really, really inexperienced registered nurses would stand me up in the corridor to tell me how irresponsible I was with bachelor midwifery trained midwives. And I remember saying to them, you know, if you'd applied for a position here 10 years ago and you weren't a midwife, you wouldn't have got a job. So, you know, things change. And so we'd talk those things through. And hopefully I did get through to a lot of them. <laughs> then we supported our enrolled nurse. And I think I've got, is that, oh, that's, no, oh, that's it. Yeah. So then we imported, uh, supported our enrolled nurse, Carolyn, to become a midwife. So we got her into a bachelor midwifery program and, um, and she'd been an enrolled nurse for 25 years and she'd been working mostly in the maternity space for more than half of that. And she was actually a really excellent enrolled nurse. And then so, we, so she got into midwifery and that was quite a culture change and quite painful because he was Carolyn who was kind of, you know, kind of on the bottom, the enrolled nurse rung and now sort of studying to become a midwife and there was interesting um, resistance to that she was the first one to do her play her all her placements in rural and remote except for a placement in a high risk birthing service and a special care nursery um, so she was the first one to do that basically as an apprentice caseload midwife in Roma and Carolyn is now one of our senior midwives in Roma and she's an excellent excellent clinician um, and then um, we transitioned then into full MGP a, a, a year or two years after we'd started with the, with the dual models of running concurrently. Um, and so the core was no more, even though the core was diminishing, we were actually not covering shifts. We weren't able to cover shifts for a, a core model anyway by that stage. Uh, so with 100% transition to that model, it becomes then an all of hospital model. And so our nursing staff are very important members of our team. And 
they were already, I mean, as anyone who works in rural remote areas know that nursing staff are really important members of that maternity team from the perspective that they will answer when an emergency buzzer goes off. They will be the ones who can organise the emergency cesarean section teams to come in. They'll help us sort out our dangerous drugs with, you know, get us our infusions for epidurals and all those sorts of things. So um, they're already very valuable to the, the maternity service. So we provide education for all of those um, nursing staff um, so that we could provide, they could provide basic inpatient care for well women and well babies with a midwife on call 24-7. And I do stress well women and well babies. I mean, if you had a woman with high blood pressure, et cetera, and she's being transferred out, all those sort of things, we would not be leaving them. We would be making sure that there was a, a midwife on site at all times. They all went through the imminent birth program, which we provide for all of our nursing staff in our non-birthing services um, that, uh, to help them deal with an unplanned birth should that occur. And because that program includes a lot of postnatal care, we use that program for our level three facilities as well. Our educators also developed a two-hour package on neonatal cares where they taught um, nurses about the use of the newborn early warning tool, um, doing observations, checking nappies for output, just those basic um, things for newborn babies. And as part of that process, we developed a procedure um, that we call care of inpatient maternity clients by mid-free and nursing staff. And that provided that that was to provide real clarity for the roles of nurses and midwives and the responsibilities of nurses and midwives in caring for those women. We found that um, our younger nurses were really, really enthusiastic and some of others weren't that enthusiastic, but we developed this procedure in consultation with all of our nurses, midwives and line managers across the Southwest. And, and we've tweaked a little bit here and there um, over the last few years, but we basically think we've got most of the principles in there. As part of this process too, we also added in some extra stuff around clinical handover because we found that sometimes wasn't being done well. So our educators did a lot of work around clinical handover, particularly between um, midwives to nurses, but also nurses to nurses when there wasn't a midwife on site. And um, we put SBARs or some examples that we could put into those procedures and clinical handover, I think, continues to be a specific and ongoing strategy to educate and support our nursing staff. Um, the midwife and the nurse, they'll perform a fundal check together. They'll assess blood loss together, any wounds, if the woman's had a caesarean section, for example, the feed chart. And then they'll make an ongoing midwifery care plan that, um, for the, that member of nursing staff. And as it's a bedside handover, the woman's also involved and the woman still has a phone. So she is still able, even though as an inpatient, to call her midwife if she feels the, the need to do that. And again, I do stress we're talking about well women and well babies. So we now have three hub and spoke models um, across the southwest. Um, we're obviously the hub sites, so Roma, Charlevoix, St George, but we also have a number of other multi-purpose health services and some community clinics that we also visit to provide antenatal and postnatal care in outreach communities, so that women don't have to travel long distances just for you know an antenatal visit, for example. Um, and the, with the exception of those four community clinics in Wallam, Villa, Bolin, um, Bargaminda, and where's the other one? Morven. Um, all of those other services have had their birthing services downgraded in the last 25 years. So 25 years ago, they all birthed in their local communities. And this is just that's just been the trend, hasn't it, across rural and remote Australia with the closure of birthing services. So that doesn't that doesn't sit well, and you know, and rightly so, with some of those communities, it's still um, a big problem for some women needing to, needing to travel, you know, certain distance, quite significant distances, really, to give birth. Um, so, so when um, when they do, I'll find my little mouse again. So um, in St Georgia, where we have got our three F tier midwives, they'll travel out to Durambandi, Bolan and Mungandai, um, which is up to one and a half hours away to provide antenatal postnatal care. Same in Roma, there's about an hour to Injun, an hour to Mitchell, an hour to Stratton and half an hour to Wallambilla. But our Charleville midwives have the longest distances to travel. Um, 
they've got Kanamala and Quilby are both two and more than two hours away and Augatha and Morven, which are one hour from there from the hub site. We have also Thargaminda as a, um, a community clinic in the southwest, but it's a five hour trip from Charleville and we have a Royal Flying Doctor service go there every week to two weeks for community clinics. So we have less than five women giving birth in Kanamala every in sorry in Thargaminda every year. So um, our RFDS midwives will keep in contact with the team back in Charleville to let us you know, keep us in the loop about women there and make introductions as required. So that, that tends to work pretty well as well. Now, on those outreach services, we also get our midwife once a quarter to be able to check the emergency birth box with the member of nursing staff. Um, it's always funny, isn't it? And and I do see it from their point of view because I'd be terrified if the, if the, if the if it was flipped, but, you know, we always have a bit of a laugh that some of these unbelievably experienced rural nurses, they can deal with a leg, someone coming with the leg half hanging off um, and quite happily deal, not happily deal with, but quite efficiently deal with that. But if a woman comes in having a, having, um, a contraction, they tend to be quite terrified. So it's the one, number one thing that all the dons across our rural services will say. So, um, <laughs> yeah, but as I said, I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be too good with someone coming with their leg half off. So, <laughs> um, so down in Charleville, we have in, just increased our FTE from three to four uh, midwives, which is part of our Rural Maternity Task Force reports that we did for Charleville in the far southwest and also for St George. As Sue mentioned, the Rural Maternity Task Force um, process just a bit earlier and um, we had three in there until we managed to with recommendations from the, the reviews that we'd done of Charleville to get an extra midwife there. Now that gives us um, a bit of extra um, leeway in terms of being able to um, provide some more community-based care as well because you've um, it's a bit hard to have things happening outside of Charleville when you've only got three midwives in total there. Um, so I also wanted to put uh, uh, put something in here about grads and students. You know, we've got really good evidence that was really good support that and really good midwifery leadership. And can I stress that um, that grads can really will really thrive in continuity midwifery care models. In fact, they're the only cohort that's really in majority actually seeking to work in those models. So it's really important that we can um, get them in and train them up in it. Um, and when they work in those midwifery continuity of care models from the beginning and they've got good support, they really quickly develop skills and they become quite impressive young midwives. Um, we try to work them with a, in partnership with a senior midwife, reduce caseload, those sorts of things to start off with. Um, and we provide on-site presence, and I'm not saying in the birth suite, but in the hospital when they've got a woman in the birth suite because after hours in our small services, if you've got a woman in, in labour overnight, for example, you're going to be the only midwife in the building. So we want to put some more supports around them for that. We couldn't maintain our workforce without grads, but as you can imagine, that can be a double-edged sword as well because uh, if grads can't get a job in Brisbane, but they get a job in, in a, as a case of midwife for six to nine months, for example, then they're really employable again elsewhere. So um, we did find that we were losing quite a significant number who wanted to go back with to family, etc., who lived on the coast and those sort of things. So now we try and ask for a two-year commitment because there's a whole lot of work that our local midwifery uh, MGP midwives put into grads to upskill them. And they've just upskilled them to become, you know, really effective members of the um, MGP and then they leave. So it's a little bit disheartening for them when that happens too much. Now, I wanted to talk about, uh, oh, so I always, I always forget to go through some of these slides, but here we go. Um, that's just going into Charlotte, but I wanted to talk about Kanamala because that's been um, an area that we worked really hard to look after. Um, Kanamala means Long River and um, it is one of my favourite places and um, it's got a 60% population of Aboriginal people and um, we have approximately 15 women from Kanamala giving birth every year. Now, Kanamala is one of these areas that's had, uh, that had their birthing service closed about 12 to 15 years ago, and it still remains an open wound in that community. Um, so 
up until six years ago, uh, we would still have women who would turn up in labour at the Katamala Hospital without a midwife or a doctor with obstetric um, training. And um, so we have put in a number of strategies to try and support that community as much as possible. And that is, even if there's only one woman to see in an antenatal consultation, a midwife will be in Katamala every single week. And now that we've increased to 4FTE, we've now got the capacity for midwives to spend more time there to provide antenatal education and support the Aboriginal medical service staff there as well and the health workers um, with education etc um, so the midwife doesn't have to be back in Charnable to maintain that birthing service so um, yes we, we continue to um, support as best we can um, the women and the community in Kanamala. Um, we did assess that against the Kanamala we did assess Kanamala against the Australian Rural Birth Index, uh, and it came back as 4.9, um, which does align with the service that we currently do, and that is that it's unlikely to have birthing, but will have an antenatal and postnatal service. But we did focus groups with um, Aboriginal women in Kanamala and also in St George as part of that Rural Maternity Task Force report. And of course, you know, I'm not telling anyone here how, how distressing it is to have that capacity to birth on your ancestral land, sort of that taken away. And um, as I said, it's still a bit of an open wound, but we're certainly looking at making things better for women who have to travel. And um, we've got some really nice accommodation in Charleville, but there's still gaps there, which we're looking to um, fix up. But the women who travel away to Toowoomba, for example, you know, the patient travel subsidy scheme, I I see it as a, I mean, I hear problems all over, all over the country, you know, as to how it doesn't quite meet the needs of women and we need to improve it. Um, I've, I know that Northern Territory has issues, Western Australia has issues, and certainly we do in Queensland as well, making sure that we can provide travel and accommodation that that meets the needs of um meet, meet the needs of these of these women um oh that's just long river <laughs> beautiful long river um so another thing that is really it's been a really important innovation for us in rural and remote queensland is what we call qmid and i don't know it doesn't say qmid on that slide but oh, except for down here it's qmid at health at the, the email address but it's there there are senior military advisors now who work for um, retrieval services queensland and um they provide a virtual service for all of our all of our um, midwifery and also medical teams for any issues related to maternity services. They can actually dial in and check CTGs, for example, if we've got midwifery fatigue in that local area where you can't get a second person looking at a CTG every few hours, for example. Um, and they'll actually come and work some work on or with our teams from time to time. Uh, working with particularly young graduate midwives and case their midwives in the MGPs and those three services. So we absolutely love our QMID. And even though it's not 24-7 um, yet, we're working on it. We hope that in the future that we can have 24-7 access to them um, for anyone that needs some support and assistance within that maternity service, including even on outreach visits. You know, if a grad's on an outreach visit and she's got an eye and we do, we will supply them with a telehealth-enabled iPad to telehealth back into the service, but they can actually call to call Temsu as well, so or the or the QMID team. And, and really importantly also is that these amazing midwives from the QMID team, they'll actually dial into some of our nursing teams in the afternoons to see if they've got any maternity midwifery patients, uh, midwifery um, clients on the ward and, um, and how they can help the nursing teams provide basic inpatient postnatal care. And that's just really, really fantastic for when we've got midwifery fatigue happening um, in that particular service. Um, okay, so oh, that was oh, that's the thing of the Rural Maternity Task Force. But there were some nuggets, I think, that we got from the Rural Maternity Task Force reports for that we did for the Southwest. And that is, and that is, and it was so such a big thing. Women want midwifery continuity of carer. They do not want midwifery continuity, they do not want the continuity of care um, thing. They um, 
the women that we consulted, and we consulted 50 women, we had 50 women that we consulted across the Southwest for these reports. And those women that were in an agency line in some of our MGPs were when we had, obviously when we had some staffing shortages and we had to fill it with an agency midwife who would leave after six, 12 weeks, those sorts of things, and the next one would come on. Um, they actually were not impressed, even though they said the midwives provided really good care, they had no problems with that, but they just were, they just listened to their colleagues and their friends at playgroups who did have that continuity of care with the known midwife who were able to say how reassured and secure that they felt and being able to say call their midwife at seven o'clock at night because the midwife knew them to tell them about the concerns they had around fetal movements, whereas these other women said, well, we just didn't know who were ringing and they didn't know our story. And, you know, those usual suspects, those usual issues that women have when they don't receive um, continuity of midwifery care. Um, so they want the security of having them having a known midwife. Uh, in one maternity service, though, we have had some uh, resistance to the MGP by the broader and quite influential clinical community. And so I wasn't too sure what I was going to find in that community when we did that, did that broad consultation there. Well, it was it was actually quite hilarious. These women have none of it. They only wanted midwifery continuity of care. They were not going to be duped by um, someone saying that it was a great service without having their known midwife. So <laughs> it was that the message was loud and clear. And interesting enough, also with our focus groups with the with Aboriginal women in Kunnamulla and St George, they actually wanted, and they state, stated that quite clearly, they wanted continuity of midwifery care across pregnancies they didn't if there was a midwife a local midwife in that community who cared for them for their first birth that's who they wanted for their second and so that was another loud and clear message which uh, you know which we now also see in some of the literature as well so that relationship with a known midwife comes through every single time whether it's just through the pregnancy or whether it's across the pregnancy um, so people ask me what I would have done differently and and I was very naive. I was quite naive about the whole thing, really. Um, but I think if I was going to do it, do something different, I'd be much more cognizant right from the beginning of who the influences were around us, you know, who was going to work for you and who was going to work against you. And Sue, I can see you smiling with that. So <laughs> clearly, uh, you know, as I said, I was a bit naive. <laughs> Not anymore. Um, because in some service, it can be a nurse manager who's got that reverential authority across the hospital and she can make or break it, you know, even though she's not a midwife. Or some places it's the medical team, some places it's the registered nurse midwife who um, is committed to the status quo. And yeah, so and identifying those early adopters too is a really important part and bringing them on and nurturing them is such an important part of setting something like this up. Now, I know that some of you already seen this, but this is the, um, the graphic that Clinical Excellence Queensland developed and uh, with the Office of the Chief Nurse Midwife, and they've put this onto mouse pads. And I give this to anyone who walks. And so we had the Queensland Rural Remote Clinical Network Forum recently in Cairns and Warren Snowden was the keynote speaker. So I grabbed him afterwards and gave him a mouse pad and gave him the whole spiel as to why we needed to upscale midwifery continuity carer. I was telling him how the um, benefits of midwifery continuity carer, such as around preterm birth, et cetera, are amplified when, you know, in, in Aboriginal communities and therefore it was an absolute necessity and that he was to use his influence wherever he could anyway he graciously took the mouse pad so um and said he liked it so that was a good thing but then i'd also give one to the chair of the queensland clinical network all of our dons across the southwest have this sitting on their desk so i don't think that can be uh, that can be an, um said enough in terms of this is a model that saves lives and we should be promoting it um, and my final word, and this is also around our models, is, you know, this, this publication on the state of the world's midwifery, and one of the things it talks about is the need to have expert midwifery leadership at every single level of decision making. And so 
you know, and we've got um, across, and I know it's happening in Queensland. I push, I don't know whether where it's happening in other states. I suspect so. Is that um, more in, that there's in some of these small rural maternity and regional maternity services, they may not have a midwife who can, who's going to be a unit manager, and that they'll put a nurse unit manager in there, operationally managing midwives, and. Um, I think we see over and over again that without that midwifery lens um, that these things break down, we actually do need expert midwifery leadership across the across the board from the unit manager to the to the nursing slash midwifery director and those sorts of all those sort of positions um, because that that expert midwifery lens um, if it's not there and and case said midwives are managed, sort of micromanaged and just allocated tasks. It doesn't work. It breaks down continuity and women don't get as, um, as near as good a service as what they could get. So that's just my last thought on all that is that I think expert midfield leadership, we should all be advocating and resisting anything that tries to break that down. And that's it. Wow. <laughs> Thanks so much, Anne. That was fantastic. Um, I might get you to stop sharing and yep. we can ask people to turn their cameras on. We've got yep. a few questions, so I might um, I might just ask you what's in the chat, but that was great. And um, I know I heard it in um, Nullamboy when you came up, but I actually feel like I uh, understand it so much better now and can see the application in, you know, we're trying to do big redesign projects in the Northern Territory and um, you can, uh, you know, a lot of it sounds um, very similar to what we're trying to do. One of the questions is um, uh, how do the midwives um, do the remote outreach part? Are they part of the continuity team and are they, what happens with intrapartum care if they're out on uh, a trip and do their trips, um, uh, any of their trips um, overnight? Yeah. Uh, have I stopped sharing? No. I, I found out I could ease could easily share but now I can't stop sharing um <sighs> look it, it doesn't matter if you can't I just thought it might be nice to see all the faces I know I want to see the faces too uh, let me let me take off my laser pointer that might have been my problem yeah that, I learned something new today I've never seen that laser <laughs> pointer before. Except, yeah well now we've got it all because um I still haven't been able to stop it it should be a little red box, stop share. I know. It just says I've just got new share and resume share. Ah, the bane of my life. Oh, stop share. Found it. Beautiful. Okay. <laughs> wonderful. And look at all these wonderful faces. That's, that's great. Um, so, um, yeah, why don't you tell us a little bit about how that outreach works? That's uh, some yeah. questions there about that. Yeah, and look, and that's one another reason why we have... Um, uh, with an extra FTE of midwives in Charleville, it's allowed us to be able to, to be able to stay a midwife to stay overnight in certain areas. Um, they generally plan between themselves. I mean, the MGPs are you know they're self functioning dynamic organisms, aren't they? So um, if a midwife's going on outreach somewhere, then generally her women will know, or um, generally they will have organised for anyone to cover for them during that time. So. Um, we have enough midwife FT in in Rome when it's fully recruited. I mean, it's, when it's not fully recruited or when we're in really a bit of a dire situation from time to time, as are other rural and paternity services, sometimes you have to scale them down, uh, the outreach, just so that you could maintain that core service within the birthing hub. But generally... Um, yeah, they'll work it out between themselves and we do our absolute best, our midwives do their absolute best to get to women in their own communities, but there are times when it's not possible. And um, with that, um, the way it's working, are they all um, line managed centrally or do they have different managers and are the managers midwives? Yeah, we've got three birthing services and we have our three nums are not midwives and our three doms are not midwives. One is a... Um, uh, was a midwife, but is now gone to a non-practicing midwife. And then there's the position such as my position as clinical midwifery consultant to supply that professional leadership across the district, but operationally in terms of, you know, doing all the recruitment and all that sort of stuff, um, 
or that 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 groundwork in doing that sort of thing um, sort of sits with the operational manager, which is a nurse unit manager. Now that can be, and that, that can work actually well um, with a really good integrated um, understanding between everyone, but sometimes um, it can make, make things a bit difficult as well. But at the moment, yeah, that's where we stand. And and that's one of the reasons, because I know that Southwest isn't the only one that has this happening. It's in other HHSs as well. And I just think we need to look at how we can sort of stop that sort of going further. So with the, um, so your position as kind of the change manager and, and support midwife providing the leadership you didn't actually manage anyone you helped the whole redesign without managing just I, I, I was the midwife I was the midwife unit manager in Roma to start oh, off okay. with yeah yeah <laughs> that's that's when when um, we had that first big workshop uh, that um, and I can see Sue Kruski on there now hi Sue um, is that um, that's when I was a midwife unit manager in Roma and then a couple of years later I took on a district-wide position Okay. And um, okay, so that's that's great. And um, there's a question here, how the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health workers and practitioners incorporated into the models? Okay. So um, we don't have too many health workers per se at the moment. We have, in, we have Aboriginal liaison officers and yes, and they're a really big part of our, a part of our team. Um, we also, when I did the focus groups for the Rural Maternity Task Force, I brought on one of the um, Aboriginal health workers for maternity from Toowoomba to give her feedback on to how it worked down that end and the gaps that they saw in the system. But when we've got them, when we have our Aboriginal health workers slash liaison officers working with us, I mean, it's absolutely, it's, it's essential, isn't it? I mean, I probably should have put more into that at the beginning. Uh, I did say about our beautiful health worker who was really advocating for continuity midwifery care first off, and, and she was a, a really big part of that. But like everywhere, um, yeah, our health workers and, and liaison officers are really, really important members of our team, and they create that, um, they provide that that cultural input, et cetera, and um, help us to be able to provide better care for women, basically. Mm -hmm. And um, there's there's a question here saying from Glenda saying um, she would like to know about the facility you have for the women of Panamala when they come in for sit down. I presume you're talking about any women that have to travel for in the territory we call it sit down. So yeah. coming to yeah, you do yeah. as well. Yeah. I, I learned that term myself when I was <laughs> when I was in the Northern Territory recently. Oh, so. okay. Um, but so we have um, we don't have it in Roma yet, but it probably will be coming. But we do have a couple of units, quite really quite nice self-contained units, each with two bedrooms. Um, up in Charleville, for example, and also in St George. So, but particularly talking about Kanamala slap to Charleville. Um, so women will come and stay in those facilities with their families. Um, we still find, though, that there's some gaps. So we're working on better collaboration even between the AMSs because, um, you know, those women might come up from, from Kanamala to Charleville and whilst they've got really good facilities, if it's 45 degrees and she's 38 weeks pregnant and the supermarket's, you know, 500 metres away, which I think is about 500 metres away, um, and she doesn't have transport, then that's a problem, you know. We, the, <laughs> it's, it's quite difficult. So um, we've sort of been looking at how we can redesign that to make sure that, you know, the health workers across the, across the district can um, liaise better there, along with our own staffing to provide that for women. So that's, that's our, been our problem. Um, what, what, that's what came up in our community consultation with Kanamala. The other problem we have is that when we transfer them out to higher level services, you know, it can be really hard to find suitable accommodation for women who are heading away for four or five weeks. And, you know, we've been in a situation and we're, we, we've hopefully remedied, remedied this to a certain extent with, with um, much really good communication with our midwife navigator and the um, health worker in Toowoomba who manages the women that come, that, that come through. Um, but we've had the situation where a woman's a type 1 diabetic and she gets accommodation with no cooking facilities. 
you know, and then therefore, you know, <laughs> she'll survive on takeaway, I mean, which is totally at odds with um, how it should be. So I think we think we've remedied that to a certain extent, but, you know, we still have to manage it from time to time to make sure that they can have proper facilities so that they can manage their health as well as all those other issues when they're in sit down in another place. Yeah, it's so challenging, isn't it? Um, we have a lot of women that relocate for birth and it's um, it's mm. been a nightmare really for years. Um, there's yeah. a, there was a question earlier on saying, can you um, remind us of the name of that um, course that's for, I think it was Imminent Birth? Imminent Birth. That's a, Just, que- that's that's a Queensland Health Developed course. It's actually really, really good. Um, and But I understood there were similar, other similar programs in other states, so... Uh, but certainly in, in Queensland, it's called Imminent Birth. And it's a face-to-face um, workshop that our mid- midwife educators provide. And they go out to the different different um, health services and do that with our, uh, and do it with the nursing staff there. It's actually very good. Is that, we've got um, the Crown, of course, the remote health um, maternity right. emergency care course for non-midwives. But um, right. I, I thought you had an actual course for the um, ENs and the RNs in the hospital for providing postnatal care. If you didn't yeah, we use, there. yeah. yeah. Is that a no, di- same course? No, 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 no. It's, it, we actually decided we'd incorporate it into one because the imminent birth course does oh, okay. incorporate a lot of postnatal care. So we've just, Rather than develop a whole new course or whatever, we just we uh-huh. use that and we put all of the um, all of the nurses through it, and which is a good thing because I know that from time to time a woman will turn up even in our birthing services when there's not a midwife in the building who hasn't been able to get there yet. You know those women who give birth really quickly, and we actually had an enrolled nurse deliver a baby a few years ago. So, and she'd done an imminent birth course, and she was as happy as Larry. <laughs> mind you the, mid, yeah. the, the midwife walked in the door just as the baby came out so but still you know it was important yeah, because yeah. she'd only she'd only done it recently and it worked well look we've got two minutes left there's a, a two more questions there that are just asking do you have midwives on different levels like n2s n4s or m4s and do you have um uh, positions for new grads you talked about the student that was um, facilitated and nurtured, but what about the new grads? And Yes, we do have graduates. Um, in fact, we've got graduates in all three, all three facilities at the moment. Um, when, they're okay. nurtured, when they're nurtured well, when they have that mentorship, clinical supervision, uh, expert midwifery leadership, all those sorts of elements that, are required to support grads that so we read in the literature you know that so Cummins has done a whole lot on that and mm. um I just thinking because we've just written up a, up a, a how-to guide uh, recently on um on how to support graduates that are going straight into midwifery cognitive care models so yeah when they're supported well they actually probably do better than those mid graduate midwives who are in even some of the biggest services where they feel lost in the system not there with the same same group of midwives they don't have a as close a mentoring relationship so there's some real keys to um continuity of care uh, graduates to continuity of care models and it can be applied across metropolitan and rural alike yeah, look, um, we're coming to an end. Uh, there is one hand left. I think last question to you, Philippa, and then we'll um, have to sum up. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to just, just clarify, in terms of caseload for the um MGP, so traditionally MGPs would be like a one FTE to four birthing women women per, per midwife. However, I work in, in the... Um, WA Country Health and I'm conscious of how that is not necessarily applicable to rural I just wondered what your um, case loading modelling was about it's very different for each facility and um, like for example even though we've got the lowest amounts of births happening in St George um, we still maintain a birthing service there because the distance to the next birthing service is generally you know um, too great for a start but um, if you've got 60 or 70 women that are being provided with care, 
um, in a community, we will still have three midwives there, you know, because you can't, prov- two midwives, you just can't support days off, et cetera, can you, or annual leave, et cetera. So we still have three midwives. So they've got a, a reduced caseload than, say, the um, the midwives who work in another area. We try and say in our local agreement a maximum of 36 a year, but usually it's a lot, mm. yes. Sometimes per month it's more because some months you'll have a whole lot more women birthing and the next month you might only have half the amount. So um, it does go in waves and waves. I'm going to jump in, Anne, because our time's up and we always try not to go over. But um, thank you so much. That was just brilliant. And everybody knows your details now and are able to contact you if needed. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, Great work and congratulations on everything you've done there. Thanks, Sue. Great to see See you. See you later. Bye. (laughs) Bye.